Right, Doomberg, how are you? Peter, I'm doing doing amazing. Another day in paradise. We have a big green chicken and a big bull. <laughs> we were joking before you hit record. It's apropos for the times, you know. Bitcoin's well, mooning overnight, so good for you. Yeah, well, it's been it's been like that most of the year. Uh, that's been a good. I one. have no, I have noticed you've got a little bit trolled based on our last interview. Well, that's all right. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about this coming back on you. And for those who don't know, you asked me at what price might I consider putting an allocation mm-hmm. towards Bitcoin, and I sort of hesitated, and then I just picked a number, and I said, you know, if it got to five thousand dollars, I might throw a percent of my net worth behind it, and. Um, Suddenly, people thought I was waiting for $5,000 to, uh, to buy Bitcoin, and uh, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I'm quite happy. I have lots of friends who are in Bitcoin. My good friend, Tony Greer um, of TG Macro, made a great call. He basically bought the bottom at the end of the uh, sell the news ETF um, drop in Bitcoin, and he's um, ridden it since then. Tony's a friend of mine. I hope it goes to a million. You're a friend of mine. I hope it goes to a million. I, it, it's just funny. You know, but the trolls are funny. It's actually one of the things I don't miss about Twitter. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, D- Danny, Danny is also a troll. He's put here in my notes. He's put first question: When Bitcoin five k? So uh... <laughs> you know, <laughs> you should ask Danny. You know, I bought a piece of land in 2019, and I just heard from my realtor that if I listed it today, it would um, it would sell for more than double. And um, so I've spent the last day and a half trolling all my friends who did not buy land in 2019. Well, you should sell that and buy Bitcoin. <laughs> I, I have a rule. I buy one major piece of land a year, and in 15 more years, I'll have 20 great pieces of land. You know, This is just the way I choose to compound my wealth. It's something to retire on. Well, listen, since we've last spoke, obviously the world's got a little bit more crazy, and I'm sure between this time and next time we speak, the world, the world will get a little bit more crazy again. Um, but we, we're going to talk about gold. And naturally, if we talk about gold, I'm going to bring up things to do with Bitcoin. But you wrote uh, a piece called Gold in Resolution where you talk about 2024 as potentially a historic year for gold. So uh, let's, set, let's set the scene. Are you a gold bug yourself? Uh, I own a fair bit of physical gold. And then when I'm preserving my liquidity during periods where there are nothing attractive for me to invest in, in the private markets, I tend to hold my liquidity in Fizz, the, the Sprott um, product. Uh, but I view gold as a vehicle for saving as opposed to an investment. But yes, I, I do own a fair bit of gold. And, and we wrote that piece, not necessarily saying 2024 was going to be a bullish year for gold, but there are two main sort of big ideas in the gold camp. In the same way that Bitcoin, you know, the obsession around getting these ETFs approved. Well, the two big, you know, ahas in the gold community are one, restoring gold's proper place in world trade as a neutral reserve asset. Um, There's a a whole army of people who believe that the days of the U.S. Treasury and European debt instruments being neutral reserve assets are numbered. And the the end of those days was only accelerated by the freezing of Russia's reserves. Um, And there was some thought that on the second anniversary of the war in Ukraine, um, certainly the UK and, and the US were pushing to outright seize those reserves and give them to Ukraine as political support for continuing to fund the war in the West has dried up. And so that was one um, big deal in 2024 for gold. And then the second, of course, is that um, there's this long-held belief that the paper price of gold is being manipulated down by the West. And um, if that is true, um, the development of the physical gold exchange in Shanghai will put that to the test. And in fact, we're writing an update piece. Um, it's being edited as we record this, where we're going through our hits and misses of the last five months. And the persistence of the Shanghai gold premium um, is pretty interesting. You know, Today in Shanghai, gold is selling for $40 an ounce more than it is in New York and London. And so in theory, you ought to be able to stand for delivery uh, in London and sell it short in Shanghai and deliver physical and capture 40 bucks for free. And the fact that that arbitrage persists indicates that gold is probably going to flow from London and New York to Shanghai. And coincidentally, if gold is going to be restored uh, as a significant neutral reserve asset, then the Chinese might be interested in owning a lot of it by the time that happens. And so two very interesting phenomena, and both of those will be put to the test in 2024. 
And if this thing is put to the test and it is proven uh, that this it is being manipulated, do you think that actually unlocks uh, a much poten- a much higher potential price for gold? It's almost like the veil's been lifted. So that's the theory. I should say, um, I don't. I find it difficult to believe that a market as big as gold could be manipulated. But there are lots of people who believe it religiously, and I'm sure I'm annoying many of them by even pointing out that I I, I find it a bit of a dubious proposition. However, I'm prepared to believe it's possible. Anything's possible. And um, and the theory goes that there's only so much gold in the West, and eventually they have to allow the price of gold to reach its nat- natural equilibrium price, especially now that China has opened up this physical arbitrage. And arbitrage is closed. Like it, There's no reason why gold should be $40 an ounce higher in Shanghai than it is in London. It is, which means some sophisticated player somewhere is getting free money, and free money doesn't last forever. Uh, mm. And so, as the theory goes, as the the you know the weight of gold in the West shrinks to dangerously low levels, then the price will have to be allowed to find its equilibrium, which many believe is much higher than it is here. Um, and I suspect when you look at the inflation data versus gold, um, I would say that gold is probably a little undervalued. But again, since gold is a is a preservation of value for for me and not really an investment vehicle. Um, it's not something I spend a whole lot of time thinking about because if the price is artificially low, then I've been able to accumulate it at, at artificially low prices, which is fine by me. Based on this thesis, if if the price is being manipulated down, who benefits from this? The belief is again, I'm not proposing it. I'm just stating yep. what others believe. Um, the price of gold for a very long time in the West was considered by central bankers to be an indicator of inflation. And given the level of debasement that we've seen in the US dollar, for example, since Nixon removed the country from the gold window, um, you know, the, 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 the price of things has gone vertical. And that just means that actually the price of the dollar has gotten worse, right? And the dollar is weakening. Um, and if gold were to run away, that would be viewed as an indictment of the confidence in the U.S. dollar system. That's the theory. And so um, the paper markets, you know, futures and options and all that stuff that have developed over time, there's a belief in the gold community that the big banks at the behest of the BIS, essentially, um, has been keeping the, pay- the price of gold down. Um, and it's just interesting that it has persisted above 2000 here. Um, and I think in, in part because of the the demand for gold in China. And look, it, it could just very well be that Chinese citizens are worried about the stability of their own economy and they're buying gold as fast as they can. And it's just taking time for the market to um, level up to that demand. Uh, that's an alternative theory that uh, I think is difficult to nullify that also explains the observable data uh, because the property collapse in China and, and a lot of people have a lot of their net worth tied up in second and third apartments in various ghost cities. And perhaps there's a bit of panic going on and there's a, a bit of a flight to a flight to quality or maybe even a flight to speculation vehicles, um, anything other than real estate kind of stuff. Um, and so we shall see, but we wrote that piece because um, if it is true, then a full year of, of that type of arbitrage persisting in Shanghai um, w- would indicate that you know something's got to give. So we'll find mm-hmm. out. Like I said, in resolution, it could resolve either way. We weren't actually making a prediction. We were just predicting that we would have a better sense of things. If, if the price of gold creeps up to $2,250 an ounce and the premium shrinks to $5 an ounce um, just because of the sort of the friction cost of moving gold around the world, um, then I would say that the paper price is, is probably not being manipulated, at least anymore. Uh, but if it suddenly explodes up to 3000 or 4000 which, look, for Bitcoin, that's nothing. Like, that's Tuesday. But gold <laughs> is, you know, a lot less volatile and has a... a sort of a, a different type of buyer um, with a different, um, as uh, Ivan on tech would say, different pumpamentals. Um, and so <laughs> it's not, it's like one of my favorite characters on YouTube, I must say. I, I, I watch his uh, Let the Pump Be With You video at least once or twice a week. Um, and it's, I find it inspiring. But gold is just a different market than Bitcoin for a variety of reasons. Yeah, so this, uh, this price manipulation, it, I, Sometimes I wonder, is, is it perhaps that uh, people suspect it's being manipulated and their thesis exists because gold hasn't performed how they expect it would under current kind of market conditions? And so then I would question, well, why hasn't it performed? And 
could it be that people are actually going to different assets during these market conditions yeah. where you want that kind of store of wealth? Have people moved more into uh, property or or Bitcoin? Yeah. Are these these you know Lakers front row tickets? Are these competitive assets? That just seemed a little bit more enticing. Look, this is a very profound question, actually, and it's something we've written about and something we've experienced yeah. with some of the blowback that we've um, received when we articulated our view that we think peak cheap oil is, is a myth. Um, the difference between an analyst and an advocate is how they react to news that doesn't go their way. Yeah. An analyst, which we try to be, and look, to an extent, everybody's an advocate. When you make a prediction, you'd like to be right, and the initial data coming in when it goes against you is difficult to consume. And sometimes you try to find reasons why it might not be right. But, you know, the market is the market. And um, and so an advocate is always looking for um, reasons to explain away data that doesn't go against them, whereas an analyst's job is to ponder what the data is telling you. Now, one of the possible things the data is telling you is the prices are manipulated. That's just one of many options. You just went through several others that make just as much sense. Um, and so um, I, I, I do think it's important to try to understand what's true to the best that you can, uh, even if what you discover to be true goes against something you have said publicly or something you had previously believed. That's okay, I think, as long as you're authentically willing to admit such mistakes and um, have a mindset of continuous improvement, your, your listeners in your case or our readers in our case will stick by you and end up. And that's why about every 30 or 40 pieces we write, we do a look back at four or five, a couple we got right, a couple we got wrong, and what did we learn? Our, our mistake management philosophy is they should be rare, admitted to, corrected, and learned from. Um, mm. And I think as long as you do that systematically, you really aren't afraid of mistakes anymore. Um, you'd rather not make them, of course. Nobody bats a thousand, as we would say here in the US, but um, we try to have a good hit rate. Um, but yeah, I think you know this... Paper gold suppression hypothesis is, per, is, 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 is pervasive in the gold community. Um, I'm, a, as a, I'm agnostic to it. I kind of buy gold at a steady pace um, and because I have a certain savings rate. And gold is one of the things we, we allocate our savings to in addition to land and collectibles, like you, you mentioned earlier. Um, and so what, what it, I, I'm going to dollar cost average into it over decades. And so... You know, if it suddenly re-rates, by the way, from 2,000 to 5,000 or 6,000 or 10,000, as some people hope, um, that would not necessarily be a good thing. That would, that would be an indicator of um, certain aspects of our society that might not be going so well. And uh, my base case is um, gold is a bit of an insurance. It sets a, helps to set a floor to my net worth. But, you know, the equivalent of buying insurance for your home and then being mad when it doesn't burn down, I... I, I I, I buy insurance against my home, hoping it doesn't burn down, and hmm. and I, I don't worry about it. And so it's a, but like, there's also the the whole content creator ecosystem which we're in, and and gold sells. Like we if if we wanted to double our subscriber base, we would only write about gold and Bitcoin. Um, and um, we were joking like we could start a new Substack. That in fact we we're thinking we would start two, um, red meat for the left and red meat for the right. <laughs> and we could write both. Um, we know how to grow such things. It, 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 they would take off. We would do well. We, we understand the Substack ecosystem and, and how to build something. We, we don't want to do that because it's not how we want to build wealth, but we could, right? I mean, and so um, be it gold, be it Bitcoin, be it peak cheap oil, um, there's a, a cadre of creators who've tied themselves to an outcome, a thesis, an agenda. And um, when others question that thesis, um, they tend to push back. So, for example, if I were to say right now uh, that I don't believe the paper price of gold is being manipulated to any meaningful degree, we would get a lot of angry emails. Um, I'm not saying that. I'm saying I'm dubious of it. I don't know enough to say for sure. The people who believe it believe it fully um, and it's core to their thesis. So we, we try really hard. We want to be in this business for decades. And I think the only way to be truly sustainable is, is to, to try your best to be an authentic analyst every day. Do your best to try to understand how the world works. Like, I'm not surprised Bitcoin is mooning. It's very simple. The pumpamentals are there. There's, there's a small float. There's a, um, a significant buyer. 
Uh, I find it interesting. I don't own NVIDIA either because I don't own basically any equities. Um, and so when NVIDIA goes to $700 a share, I'm happy for the people that own NVIDIA. And when the latest of Kathy Wood's junk companies goes bankrupt, I, I, I'm happy for the people that are shorted and I feel bad for the people that are long it. But I, ultimately, it, it's not relevant to me. Um, and so, like I say, if, if Bitcoin goes goes to 100000 in the next month, I, I'll, I'll shoot you a DM and say congratulations. Hope you take some liquidity off the table. Well, what, what is quite interesting about that is I think the reason I'm buying Bitcoin is probably almost entirely the same reason you're buying gold. Sure. Yeah. And I, good for you. If it works out better for you than it does for me, that does, again, like that, that's the mindset part that I don't, I, I, if you want to buy Bitcoin because you think currencies are going to debase, I think that's a very fine thesis and, mm. and Bitcoin is a fine vehicle to speculate uh, to that end. In my mind, given what I know, I told you, I, I, I try to buy one major piece of real estate a year. Well, I mean, I know my local real estate market and so I have an edge Right. Hmm. And I could go touch it like I could literally go walk the woods that I own. Um, and I know how to pass that through to my children in the trust that we're, we've set up. And, and so it's just what I feel comfortable doing. You know, it's back to that point. Like if, if they like take the newsletter business, like Doomberg has really been life changing. I'm totally transparent with you. Like, obviously, it's, it's the work of my life. It's been meaningfully successful. Um, we have put less than, you know, uh, until this year, we had put less than $10,000 total cash into building Doomberg and we're the number one paid finance substack in the world. That's worth measurably more than $10,000, right? I'm not going yeah. around town laughing at the person who just bought a coffee shop and saying, you should be in the newsletter business. Like it, it, this is, the, I, I hope the coffee shop does well. Hey, I'm about to open a coffee shop. Yeah, well, you know, I can tell you that the newsletter business is better. <laughs> well, listen, I know that this is a this is a luxury for me. Now. Yes. No. The, the, the funny thing about Bitcoin is when I first bought it, it was for a need. I had a need for Bitcoin to buy something. And then it became something I bought because I speculated on getting wealthy. I now, all my Bitcoin purchases now are about almost the opposite. It's, it's about not getting poor. Yeah. It's, yeah, great. It's, I, the money I need in pounds, cash flow just stays in pounds. Everything else just goes into Bitcoin because I know they'll, in my, you know, I have the conviction that at some point uh, when I spend it or pass it on, it will have more purchasing power than when I originally bought it. And look, I think that is a, there's a reason why we have a fair number of Bitcoin advocates as subscribers for Doomberg because the overlap and the Venn diagram of people who care about preserving their wealth or protecting their wealth from the government um, is, pretty large when you look at gold and Bitcoin and, and you know, value um, people who, who are worried about having achieved some success in life, but in the back of their mind are, are worried about the quality of the leaders in the Western world or the debt crisis that is inevitably coming and so on. And, and like you, I earn in fiat, I save in real assets, and I, I prefer to invest privately where, you know, we can affect the outcome. And that's been very successful for us. So we had a, a life-changing gain on one of our private investments. I, I'm not... Comparing my IRR in the private markets to what the S&P has done, um, I'm just trying to make as much money as I can in the private markets while I still have a cogent brain and I have good contacts and good deal flow. And so it's just what I'm comfortable doing. You've done the work on Bitcoin and you have the conviction and I'm saying more power to you. And frankly, I hope it works for you. Like, honestly, I sincerely hope it works for you. Um, so are you... Are you... <laughs> It'd be interesting to understand your position then on Bitcoin. So then I understand your position on gold because... Uh, is it that you you are you understand it? You understand its benefits. You understand its role. It's not the kind of asset you want to own within your portfolio. Everyone has a risk appetite or what they understand. I understand Bitcoin. I understand property a little bit. And the other thing I understand is uh, you call them sneakers. We call them trainers. I own about eight hundred pairs of rare trainers. Right. Right. They're the things I buy. Right. It, it, the trainers are the fun. The Bitcoin is like where my brains are, and the property is just like my my uh, disaster scenario backup. And is it is it that you are you? But I understand gold, right? I just don't buy it. Sure, same, probably it. similar, similar to you. Is it I, similar? Yeah. Look, I I I um I had an early experience with Bitcoin that uh, we chronicled in one of our pieces where I made an investment in an equity stack of a private company that was getting into the Bitcoin arena in 2016, 2017, before the big, the first big run up. And I watched 
the value of that very modest investment that I made. I think I made, I put 25 grand in. And at one point, the mark to market value of the thing was 15 million, but I was locked, you know, I was restricted and I watched it go from 15 million to zero. Um, and there's nothing I could do about it. I, by the way, when it was at 15 million, I, I was not buying drinks for everybody and, you know, thinking that I was going to get a, uh, you know, get a yacht or get a Lambo to speak in, in the, uh, the, the crypto vernacular, um, which is different than the Bitcoin vernacular. Um, but I, I observed it and I was confused by it. And I, so I took some time to study it. And having seen just the sheer volatility of it, um, it didn't feel like something that was consistent with my relatively conservative, steady mm. personality. So I know I can go and touch the gold I own. Like I know where it is. It's the physical manifestation of it is right there. Now other people say, you know, like I, I can put my keys on a flash drive and carry it across the border, and I know that the, I'm going to be able to port my. I couldn't take my gold and drive across the border without like firing off some detector and wonder what are you doing, sir? You know, so there's a lot of advantages to Bitcoin. I, I don't ever plan to leave the country. And so um, that, that's not one that really matters to me. But um, just for my personality, you just say you express it for your personality. Mm. Bitcoin works well for you and I'm good for you. For my personality, a combination of uh, collectibles. So you like sneakers. I like Rolex watches. Um, and I know the Rolex market and uh, I have a pretty good sense of, you know, which models are going to do well. And when you hear the rumor that a certain model is going to be discontinued, you go and scoop a couple up because, you know, scarcity, just like Bitcoin, scarcity is designed in the Bitcoin. Scarcity drives up the price of things. Um, and so I, I could wear my Rolex watches. I like them. I could touch my gold coins. I, I, I know where they are. Um, and I could go walk my land. I, I have a, my personality is such that I need to viscerally see it and touch it, which is why, by the way, we invest privately because I could go and sit down with the leadership myself. I'm not getting an audience with the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I mean, I, I can, I have for Doomberg, but I would never invest in things that we leverage Doomberg to, to make content for. And so, um, but in my private investing in the VC world or private equity world, um, I can go and see the CEO and I could visit their factory and I could say, hey, but what about this? And have you thought about that? Oh, I know somebody in this space who can help you. Let me connect you. And so you create sweat alpha that way. It's just how I was, you know, how I was meant to compound wealth. And, and look, I, again, I, I, my first experience with Bitcoin was fascinating. I, I watched it go, like I told you, from like zero to 15 and back. And it was like, well, okay, this is an asset that moves. <laughs> this is an asset that's volatile. Ideally, mm -hmm. I'm a bit of a compounder, you know, I'm a, a, I'm a tortoise, not a hare. And um, it's just how I've always been. Grew up rather poor. And so having achieved some semblance of wealth, like you, my obsession is preserving it first and building it second. And um, I, I don't, it just, Bitcoin doesn't, it just isn't for me. Even if it got to 5,000, I don't think I would have actually bought it. Um, so. Maybe one day. We'll get you there, maybe one day. The funny thing, the sneakers, I can't wear them. That would devalue them. They have to stay in their boxes wrapped up. Well, see, with the Rolex watch, though, I can say Doomberg's watch, worn by Doomberg, and maybe add some cachet value to it. Just kidding. <laughs> might, might have a reverse on that. Okay, so let's get it. Let, uh, yeah, we're, I think we're aligned on the reasons we own these assets. So let's get into the reason why you think uh, the 2024 will be a pivotal year. I also think... Uh, this is a pivotal year for Bitcoin. I think the ETFs are part of that. Uh, I think uh, people figuring out what uh, <laughs> what Michael Saylor's done with MicroStrategy is, is kind of interesting. So I think it's also a pivotal year. But let's get into that. Can we talk about the Russian asset seizure first? Sure. Um, we don't need to really get into anyone's perspectives on the war, but the war exists. Um, we have seen the previous um, uh, seizure of Russian assets both uh, from the state and uh, from what would be considered private citizens. Uh, maybe we would consider, the, consider them extensions of the state, being oligarchs. But either way, uh, just a couple of days ago, Rishi Sunak came out and said, the West must be bolder and seizing Russian assets. So what's going on here? Um, the US and the United Kingdom are pushing the Europeans hard on this issue, but the majority of Russia's assets were actually in the European banking system. Right, And so this was, of course, because Putin diversified away from U.S. Treasuries and, and uh, U.K. debt uh, by design um, after the, the Crimea 
uh, issue in, in 2014 in particular that accelerated, I believe. I'd have to go back and check the data, but he was systematically reducing his exposure to the US dollar and to the British pound. Um, and he had, I think, allowed himself to believe that he could cut a deal with uh, the Europeans. And I think if you listen to his interview with Tucker Carlson, um, which I, I found to be fascinating, um, he is clearly deeply, deeply angry with uh, Angela Merkel. Uh, and I think he, he traces this current crisis back, you know, not to the 800s as he started the interview with, but probably <laughs> to the Minsk agreement. And um, And I felt like he was telling the Western world that there was a window of opportunity in the post-collapse of the USSR era to um, invite Russia into the family of nations. And then that overture was rejected. And, and look, I, whatever you think of the war, I think war is terrible. I've gone down the rabbit hole in the past couple of months of watching these mappers on YouTube who are like updating the progress and the points of contact on the front line down to the neighborhood level every day. It's pretty fascinating. And what I find interesting about that is um, just the difference between what's going on on the ground and what's being reported in, in The Economist or The New York Times it really shows you the chasm between what is almost certainly reality and then the way it's portrayed in the West, which is kind of scary. Isn't that everything these days? Uh... That's, that's the thing. Yeah. Like what is, again, what is truth, right? As an analyst, you try to go in and figure out what's going on. Um, but back to the seizing of, of the assets, I think we froze them. The West froze them shortly after um, Putin invaded Ukraine, but they've not formally seized them. They're sort of, oh, okay. they're hung in limbo in mostly the European banking system. We're talking about $300 billion worth of assets. Um, I think it is pretty universally believed that there's no legal basis to do this and that it is a terrible idea. Um, we may be beyond that. What, what would that legal basis be? I don't know. I, it's, I don't think there is one. I think that the, the legal basis is broadly Putin violated international law, so we should decide that it's okay to take Russia's stuff. Um, a, bit, a bit how the U.S. did when they well, invaded Iraq. Uh, you know, like the, 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 the path of what about is, what about isms that is available to mm -hmm. go down here is pretty substantial, right? I mean, yeah. um, but that's not, not things to be uttered in polite company in the West uh, because then you'll be – you risk being accused uh, uh, of being a Putin sympathizer. Hey, listen, I've called a lot of people Putin sympathizers because I think there are some people out there who have mm -hmm. bought into some of his more bullshit side of the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's more the hypocrisy, which is interesting here. Yeah, well, here's my theory on all this. Like, again, um, we were early when it was not, you know, it was difficult to, to say this two weeks after the energy sanctions were imposed. We were early saying these are going to backfire. And these are going to enable Putin. And um, as we're saying in the piece we're publishing where we're reviewing some of our calls, like never have we been uh, least happy to be more right. <laughs> like, and by the way, here's the thing that's, that, that sort of occurred to me as I've been going down the military rabbit hole. We're, we're probably not going to write about it. It's just not what people come to Doomberg to read. But given the role of Russia on the energy markets, we felt it was important to try to understand what was actually going on in the conflict. Um, the same people who designed catastrophically, idiotically bad sanctions against Russia, which have undeniably, you know, um, backfired. Um, the same architects of the European energy policy, which is leading to the direct industrialization of what of what was once a a really amazing manufacturing powerhouse. They're the same people dictating military strategy in the field. And why do we think it'll be any different? Like, it's terrible to follow these mappers and see how the Russians are carpet bombing villages, no building left standing, um, and then storming them and taking them over village by village, you know, encirclement by encirclement. It's like World War II all over again. And when you watch the old videos of World War II, you think, how could this be? It's 2024. This is civilized society. How did we get here? I mean, that we're here is an indictment um, of the international order. Um, whatever side you're on. So look, I'm not a Putin sympathizer. Um, I think the war is, a, is, is however, a, on the verge of being an unmitigated fiasco for the West and for NATO. It puts Europe in an incredibly dangerous place. The speed with which gains are being accomplished on the battlefield by Russia puts Zelensky's power in some jeopardy, in our view. And I think a, a long shot Black Swan in the next six to eight weeks is, you know, as his formal term comes to an end on March 31st, that there might be some uh, political upheaval in Kiev, let's just say. 
Um, and so none of that, you know, until it absolutely has to be and can't be denied, finds its way into the Western reports. Um, you just take the sacking of Zaluski uh, here. This was known two or three weeks before. It was knowable that this was coming two or three weeks before it was announced. The fall of uh, Evgevka was knowable a month or six weeks before it actually happened and it could no longer be denied uh, in the West. You could see the pincer movement and the encirclement because of, you know, there's there's mappers that have a Russian bias and there's mappers that have a Ukrainian bias. And we've kind of found that if you um, if you only believe what they're both saying to be true, then that's a pretty good indicator of reality on the ground. Whereas if there's disagreements, you just wait and leave it in the gray zone. Um, but you could see like both sides are saying Russia has total air power now. They've gotten control over the skies in Ukraine. And it's one thing Russians know how to do is raise the territory between Moscow and Europe. Um, <laughs> they know how to march through that territory and they're doing it. And I think um, there's a lot of panic in the West, um, rightfully so. And, and I think we're flailing around, struggling what to do just as Donald Trump is, is knocking at the political support for funding Ukraine in the U.S. And that's why I think this move towards seizing the reserves, seizing the frozen reserves, was really an act, an act of a sign of desperation, really, uh, on the West part. And to do what with? To give to Ukraine? Yeah, to fund the war effort. Yeah, because um, current funding is politically unpopular. Correct. Now, Russia would do things in response, which is not, it seems like we have very one-dimensional thinkers in the West. Like, there's mm -hmm. a, apparently a similar amount of Western assets in limbo in Russia, and then I suppose he would just seize those and call it good. Um, yeah. Uh, and who knows what other consequences would be. Like, if you're a country that currently has decent relationships with the U.S., but in the past perhaps have come under the fire of the U.S., are you going to be buying U.S. treasuries or are you going to be dumping them? Well, I mean, look, there's many reasons to uh, have uh, little confidence in U.S. treasuries right now anyway, mm -hmm. not just because the fact that they may get seized if you fall out of favor with the U.S., but um, the dollar itself. The fiscal uh, situation is a mess. Yeah, yeah. it's an absolute mess. That's why I you mean, own Bitcoin and I own gold and land, yeah. Yeah, I mean, my friend James Lavish often tweets, uh, I don't know if you know James, but often tweets about this and writes about this. And uh, he's been tweeting and writing about the failed bond sales or the catastrophic bond sales recently. Um, yeah, we, got a, we have a lot of debt to refinance. And yeah. uh, I don't know who the marginal buyer is going to be, especially, and by the way, the, the fact that we sort of threatened it and made so much noise about it and then so far haven't actually done it, it's kind of like the worst of both worlds, like people who are going to be scared off by the actual Caesar are, go are going to be scared off by the threat. But then we got none of the benefit because we didn't actually seize the money and give it to Ukraine. And so um, it's kind of weird how, you know, I guess it's sort of policy by committee, right? And, and nothing good mm -hmm. ever happens in a committee. And, and I think that's sort of a, a broader indictment of Brussels, actually, and, and the NATO alliance. Like you have this committee of relatively mediocre leaders in the West today, it must be said. I think you're being kind there. Yeah. And so, you know, I, again, I, I, it saddens me to watch what's happening in Ukraine. I think um, nobody can look at what's happening in Ukraine and be happy about it, except for the neocons, perhaps in, in the West, you know, the Lindsey Grahams of the world who never saw a war they didn't like. Um, huh. War is terrible. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of, of young people being slaughtered today on both sides. Um, mm -hmm. And to what end? Like, I, it just, I know that's naive and wars happen all the time and it's the human condition. And, but, you know, to see yet another catastrophic, disastrous meat grinder of a war in, in and around Europe is, is amazing. Hmm. Have we learned nothing? You know, really, it, it's, it's really sad, actually, is the word that comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. But this this proposed seizure, where does this play into this being, uh, you know, a potential pivotal year for Bitcoin? Is it that? Do you believe that uh, states, uh, well, Russia itself, obviously China, we know has been buying Bitcoin and uh, not Bitcoin, sorry, gold. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'm in my own world there. Um, but there are other there are other states that are hostile. Uh, to the U.S. align with them, the likes of Iran. But then you've also got other countries who've probably got you know, mixed feelings, like you know, perhaps maybe a Brazil. That's you know, considering it's got relationships on both sides of this. Do you believe just the the buying of gold is like the defensive position for all of them? Well, if you 
if you, or necess- necessary if you're Russia. If you just look culturally, India in its relationship mm-hmm. with gold, China in its relationship with gold, um, you know, the BRICS countries and and the comments about you know creating their own system for economic trade. Um, I think another thing that needs to be said is the situation in the Middle East is not doing the reputation of the U.S. any favors amongst the global community these days, regardless of your views on on that conflict. I think the row between Brazil, who you just mentioned, and Israel is is pretty pretty uh, eye opening, I would say, eyebrow raising. Um, and and so you know, the, again, I'm totally underreported in the U.S., but the, the challenges the U.S. are having at sustaining their veto at the Security Council for a ceasefire. Um, uh, that the U.S.'s position at the Security Council would surprise people in the in the West if we actually reported it. Um, the threat of of things being taken to the General Assembly is real, um, and that the U.S. would lose that vote. Um, Biden coming out and saying that you know we have a ceasefire hopefully by next week, and then Qatar coming out and undermining that the next day tells you that there's a bit of chaos behind the scenes. And then we see what's going on with the Houthis and. Here's something that I, I saw that's that's not being reported really in the West. That's really amazing to me, which is um, I saw this $10,000 drone, I'm guessing, geolocating a billion-dollar U.S. Patriot missile system and guiding a, a cheap Russian missile in to destroy it. You know, I've seen several of such videos in the past couple of days. A billion dollars for a Patriot missile system, and, and the, the, the entire nature of war has changed, right? And so we see the Houthis launching these cheap drones and we're launching million dollar missiles to try to knock them down. And who's winning that war of attrition? Well, we, we frustratingly, not only are we seeing these wars again, but we're seeing wars on multiple fronts now, which is the bit that becomes a little bit scary. Um, we obviously have the Israeli Palestine conflict, uh, Russia, Ukraine, we've just mentioned the Houthis, uh, attacking a lot of the shipping lanes, but their ongoing historic, uh, 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 war they've been involved in. We have Iran obviously involved in backing a number of different factions across this. It it feels like there's this growing escalation of conflicts. Well, you didn't even mention North Korea funneling weapons to Russia and the tensions between the US and China over the Taiwan issue. And yeah. it be, starts to look like World War Three if you sort of zoom out a little bit and and uh, and squint. <laughs> you know, and and yeah. and it's interesting historical comparisons. Um you know, in the U.S., of course, World War II officially started, I suppose, when Germany invaded Poland. And for Americans, it really started with Pearl Harbor in 41. But World yeah. War II really started when Japan invaded China in the 30s. Like, if you actually trace back the series of activities, I think you could you could honestly say that in the early to mid-30s is when the, the world was set on the course for war. Um, and, well, who knows what historians will call the period from you know, 2022 to 2025, depending on how things go with China. But we have either direct or proxy conflicts between nuclear superpowers. Um, And we are risking a a direct kinetic conflict between the the U.S. and Iran. Um, We are certainly engaged in an economic war with China. Um, The the uh, cyber attacks of of, of earlier um, last or late last week um, were interesting to us. You know, um, I again a piece we've researched, but we have not written um, is on the whole fentanyl issue. Uh, this is a, an act of war in our view. This is a biochemical act of war in the United States by China. The precursors are made in China. It's only really affecting Canada and the U.S. And it all either goes directly from China to the U.S. or through Mexico and and the border. And 110,000 people died last year. That's of mostly military-aged adults. Um, China could shut that down tomorrow. Nothing happens in China that without the CCP's blessing. You saw what they did with Bitcoin miners, and you know, like if they make a decision, they know where that they know where everybody is. There's a, a small number of major factories that are making these precursors. They know where they are, and yet we just stand around and let 110,000 people die. Uh, it's really shocking. Um, so. War doesn't need to be tanks and missiles. We've seen it can be drones. And it doesn't need to be guns and bullets and soldiers. It can be drugs. And, and you know, it, it's scary, actually. I have, I have 
college age children. And so the, the thought of them getting a, a laced pill or a laced drink at a party and their lives being zapped out from under them, no matter how much hard work you've done as a parent or they've done as trying to become an adult and one mistake or one accident and poof. I mean, that, what a tragedy, 110,000 of those tragedies last year. Yeah, I was having this whole conversation the other night with my friends. We were out for dinner. We were saying we feel some ways lucky to be in the, you know, not in the generation of uh, youngsters now where casual uh, recreational drugs could lead to a higher chance of death because of fentanyl. Um, I, I can't, I mean, the amount of stories I've read of people in the US who have died after uh, taking cocaine laced with fentanyl is insane. Yeah. I know a lot of people who do cocaine or have done cocaine. I wouldn't go near the stuff now. Maybe I would have before, but I certainly wouldn't go near it now just for the, it's not worth the risk. Well, you, here's, it's, it's, here's it's roulette. The, here's the thing, Peter, that again, we researched it and then decided not to write it. And because it's just, again, it's just not what people come to Doomberg for, but it, it interested me because what interested me is I saw a New York Times article where they just casually reported that we were negotiating with China um, in return for concessions for how hard they would crack down on the fentanyl producers, which tells me that the Chinese know how to crack down on the fentanyl users. So what are we doing? Why are we even negotiating? Like you want to talk about a true cause for war. There's one. Like a foreign adversarial government is knowingly poisoning 100,000 of your people. By the way, as a drug dealer, there's no benefit to fentanyl. You're killing your customers. Mm -hmm. Right? The whole point uh, it's like a um, a disease that is that it kills its host too quickly, um, you know, but burns itself out rather quickly, which is why all of these Ebola scares are often overblown and never really find their way around the world. Yeah, but have you read the free economics on on um, uh, the drugs trade? That that often isn't some uh, the right rationality. Oh, sure. I'm just saying, like, there's no other explanation for fentanyl's proliferation in the U.S. than it's by design. That, that that's yeah. our conclusion after researching the issue for a couple of months. Um, and it's by design by the Chinese. The Chinese are killing 100,000 Americans a year, knowingly. That's my view. It's outrageous. Yeah, it's a rabbit hole I'm going to have to go down now and look into this. Uh, back to gold, though. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I say I'm lacing the uh, gold with fentanyl. <laughs> at least, um, lace my gold with some Bitcoin, would you? Yeah. So, but, but back to that. So, uh, there is, you know, potentially a pivotal year, certainly I think for nation states to be buying gold, uh, the nation state adoption of Bitcoin exists at a, at a micro level. We, we certainly are the only real true big winner in that area is El Salvador, though we've seen nods to it from Malay and Argentina. Uh, and we've seen certain nation states get into Bitcoin mining. It was just recently announced, say Ethiopia's Bitcoin mining and, I think it's pretty well known that Bhutan is also Bitcoin mining, but there's certainly a, a, a drift into there. But that's that's the nation state uh, area there. Uh, but I'm as as interested as I am in that. I'm also thinking about the audience, Dunberg, in that you know, this is retail customers, um, and so I think a bigger and more important consideration is what what you've talked about, which is the fiscal climate at the moment and, and the refinancing of debt, which seems to be a uh, now this um, kind of growing cycle uh, and shortening cycles of uh, borrowing and inflation. And I don't see, well, I was about to say, I don't see a way out of it. Let me ask you this. I, I read an article that in nine and a half weeks, uh, Malay has reduced the uh, Argentinian deficit to a surplus. Now, I haven't gone down the rabbit hole of research and uh, proofing this and fact checking it, but it seems like it can be done if what they say is true about Argentina. But you have to have a will to do that. You have to have a leader to do that. It doesn't feel like the US, the mm -hmm. Europe, UK has the will to do that. I don't feel like Biden or Trump's going to come in and say, "Well, listen, we're going to cut government expenditure by fifty percent, so um, so we can have a surplus." Um, but the fiscal situation is one that particularly bothers me. I I see it. I can see it from distance because I get to talk to people like you, James Lavish. Uh, Lynn Alden, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I cannot get my friends on the same page to understand what's going on here. And I'd love to give them this and say, look, just fucking listen to the big green chicken. 
Yeah. I, How bad is this situation? So two things. First of all, as bad as the fiscal situation is in the US, I don't think that's what's driving the price of Bitcoin. I think it's all about passive and flows and new money coming into an asset with a limited supply ahead of the having. Like, sorry, let me just. Sorry, I should. Have, I don't. I agree with you. Yes, but it's still the reason I buy it. Sure, and I think there's a. Re, there, it's a reason the early adopters got it in in the first place. But I think the marginal buyer of Bitcoin, which is driving the price, is now able to do so in a way that makes them feel comfortable because you know. Um, let, let me allocate one, two, three percent, and and from zero to three percent is a big deal, and you see those flows and. And these ETFs are passive bidders. They're price agnostic down, you know, Mike Green's rabbit hole, a, a brilliant analysis that was way ahead of the, the crowd on that. Now, to your question about the fiscal situation in the U.S., it's really amazing. Um, we, we have a very small cadre of old line fiscal conservatives that are holding their ground. But even still, I mean, we're running deficits that you would expect to see during a recession. Um, during what appears to be relatively full unemployment. I don't know what the plan is. Um, interest rates are uh, the, the the interest rate burden on the federal budget has either recently crossed or has crossed a trillion dollars a year. Um, I'm, when I believe the first time we passed a trillion dollar budget was like with Reagan and now we're paying a trillion dollars in interest. Um, <laughs> You know, this is back to what we talked about with gold and debasing of the currency and suppression of the price of gold. Um, Mile, I read the same article. I can't tell you whether it's true or not because, I, again, I like you, I, I, it's an awful lot to, to parse. It, I, the analogy I would suppose would be Elon firing 80% of Twitter and it still works. Um, I, I'm, I don't doubt that there's a lot of fat um, uh, to be shaved off of, uh, of various governments. But like in the U.S., I mean um, – you know, you have, the military can't can't account for its money, right? And we have uh, it's legal. Con, con or won't. It, it well, it, it's illegal. Sorry, it's legal for con Congress people to insider trade. Like the grift is it really is late stage, fourth turning Neil Howe type stuff. You know, we've got. Let's be very. I mean, let's let's be um, bipartisan in our assessment. Um, Joe Biden is senile. Like Joe Biden is not there. And Mitch McConnell is senile. And Nancy Pelosi needs to go. Like these people are forever politicians who've become rich at the expense of the public treasury, who are deeply corrupt. It's a it's a uni party system. I mean, if you want an explanation as to why Donald Trump is popular, it's a it's not about the, the person. It's about what he represents to the establishment, which is their least favored candidate is the one half the country is going to vote for out of spite. I mean, this is this is the situation we're in. Like, you can't watch Joe Biden speak and say that the man is there. Stop lying to me. Yeah, he's not there. But just stop lying to me. Like, I'm, I'm a free thinking adult. I'm capable of observation. Um it's, it's staggering. It's scary, actually, that we're sleepwalking towards World War III with a guy who's clearly being handled by somebody who knows. Um, and again, that's not a partisan statement. I, I, I just think you have, as an analyst, you have to observe reality. The guy can't string a sentence together. Um, and so it's scary. So here's the scariest part. Uh, forget about the fiscal situation. Half the country is not going to believe the results of the next election. Nope. Whatever happens. Whatever happens. That's it's not, going, it's going to the cause. It's going to go pear shaped. People are going to go to the mattresses. Like it's going to be a scary place. Meanwhile, you have this bipartisan pillaging of the public treasury. Things that would have gotten you thrown out of politics 10, 20, 30 years ago are commonplace now. You know, it's, it's, it's disturbing. And I, it's funny because I, I, you know, got a DM from one of our subscribers who currently lives in East Germany, and he wrote a, a poignant note. And he said, look, I, I, I'm observing the U.S. from here, and I know where it's going. And they said, you know, um, take comfort in retreating to the, to the um, serenity of your private garden once in a while. Like, control your local environment, and, and don't look at D.C. from where you live. And it, it's, it's sad advice. It's sage advice, I suppose. But, yeah, the U.S. is declining. San Francisco, the big cities, I mean, shocking, um, really shocking. 
having recently been in San Francisco to meet the, the senior leadership of Substack, uh, I was appalled. I used to go to um, the, the Bay Area a lot in my professional life. There's uh, great universities there, for example, that we would recruit at. And the decline of such great iconic cities is staggering. But the most staggering part is just that we've accepted it. Like, it's okay. Nobody cares enough to do anything about it. Um, it's amazing. It, it's scary. It's just scary. And, I, and I, I, I have great fear and anxiety about what will happen after November's election. Yeah, it's uh, sometimes cinema is uh, is is great for telling us the future, uh, and I'm very intrigued to watch the film Civil War. <laughs> well, mean, actually, the, saying it's coming, but the borders yeah. of the U.S. are not as fixed as people believe. We've had two incidents in the past six or seven months. One, of course, is Texas' decision to put the National Guard on the border and um, to, to to basically ignore a Supreme Court ruling for them to allow the feds to get in there. And some 25 state attorneys general agreed to back Texas, all led by Republicans, and many of them sent their own troops, their own National Guard troops down to the border. We have this thing we've written about, which is not nearly as serious, but we wrote about it recently about natural asset companies and this never ending desire on the part of the coastal elites to, um, to take over control of land in the West. The, the federal government owns a staggering amount of Nevada and Oregon and uh, Arizona and, and these large states in the Western Plains um, and, and the Rockies. Um, you know, they, they own 80% of Nevada. And, and, you know, again, 25 state attorneys general wrote scathing opposition to this. We're really cracking down the sort of red-blue divide here. Um, and it, it, again, you know, Trump is going to wrap up the nomination next week on Super Tuesday. I think that's stone cold block at this point. And he is being actively pursued by, um, by his political opponents and they're trying to put him in jail. Now, whatever you think of Donald Trump and whether he broke the law, this is, this is a highly unusual and dangerous situation agnostically. Even if you think Donald Trump is a criminal who should go to jail. You should find serious pause in the fact that the Republicans are nominating him anyway. Like that, and if you truly believe that the Democrats and Biden are corrupt, the fact that they are indicting, I think he's got like 60 felony indictments at this point, um, the obvious political opponent in an election, and you have unelected bureaucrats removing him from ballots in, in Maine, for example. Like these, are these are not things that you would associate with U.S. democracy historically. Right? But, but how do you get out of this? I don't know. Because it's like a death spiral. You know, we can see it coming. There is, uh, it's, it's, it's a country of two countries now. Yeah. Two, we had a piece we didn't write again called Two Americas. And um, one of the Americas makes all the energy and food. <laughs> like, I hate to break it to you. But like one of the Americas has all the truck drivers that support Trump. Like it. It's just a fact. Like Texas and Louisiana and North Dakota and Oklahoma make all the energy. I guess you still, have, of course, you have Marcellus and you have, you know, uh, some in the in a significant amount of natural gas uh, in Appalachia. But um, by and large, because the U.S. has this weird states can regulate their own energy to a large extent policy, and this you know accident of mineral rights and, and the ability to exploit them um, vis-a-vis landowners. Um, has has created this energy gigapower, but none of it is in the blue parts of the country. Like it's in the red parts, and all the food is grown in the red parts of the country. Like it's going to be fascinating. Yeah, but again, what's the way out of it? I just don't see it. I it's, it's... I don't know. I I except I'm an optimist long term. Like after the fourth turning comes the rebirth. Um, yeah, and, and so I I. I have to believe in something, you know, like, um, and I and I believe that ultimately, the human spirit, technological development, um, is going to somehow, some way, pull us out of the abyss. But it's not necessarily so. Look, empires have dissolved, countries have collapsed. Um, it happens. Like I don't think the EU is going to survive this either. But that's 
a whole different conversation. Well, we got out of that one. Yes, screwed. Kind of. And you know what? The borders are fine. I've been into Europe three times, four times since uh, uh, we left the EU, and the borders are fine. Yeah. <laughs> but the, 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 the current map yeah. of the U.S. borders is not as fixed as people would say. And by the way, neither is Canada's. I mean, you have the Quebec separatists, but also Alberta and all of the energy is made in Alberta and Saskatchewan and to some extent British Columbia. And they're not very happy, um, you know, um, carrying Justin Trudeau's bags. And uh, so we shall see. It, it's a dangerous time. The, it's, the most dangerous thing is neither side will believe the election. That's what actually, I, I don't know how we square that peg. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like, I mean, the first one I remember was um, uh, with Bush, yeah. uh, with the Chads. Bush Gore. And that's, yeah, Bush Gore with the Chads. Uh, and from everything I've looked at, uh, I kind of felt like in that scenario, and I could be wrong, but it, but they, they didn't want the recount because they knew Gore was going to win. And that's why they tried to block it. There's a lot of shenanigans in U.S. political mm. history. And I really it was a sobering read to read uh, Robert Caro's amazing four-part um, volume biography of Lyndon Johnson. You told me about this before. Yeah. So, you know, Lyndon Johnson won his Senate seat by stealing the election, basically. And I think I, the last 210 votes that put him over the line, they won by 60 votes. I'm getting the numbers wrong, I'm sure, but something like that. The last 210 people who voted in this border county uh, along the border of Mexico just happened to vote alphabetically. And he, um, he knew that he stole that election and uh, ultimately became, by the way, the majority leader in the U.S. Senate and then, of course, vice president and then ascended to the presidency upon JFK's assassination. Um, he he went about Washington D.C. calling himself landslide Lyndon, like he, he he knew that he stole that election. And so, you know, stuffing ballots and especially in the cities um, is is as old as U.S. democracy. But it, but it also at the same time, it feels very un-American. It feels so contradictory to what the founding fathers tried to achieve when they. Founded the Republic. The founding fathers founded the Republic because of taxes. Look at our tax rates now. I mean, they wouldn't but, recognize but, the U.S. that they, you know, uh, yeah. the federal government is what, a third of GDP? It's, it's, it's insane. Uh, in fact, yeah. we, we quoted from uh, one of Madison's State of the Union written speeches, and it's so quaint, like when they talk about the money and, and the account of the balances, it's like down to line items of like bridges and roads and uh, we paved a road and so we had you know making something up but um it it's unrecognizable today so that's long gone but yeah I, I think this is why of course everybody on the right thinks that you know um biden stole the election of 2020 and everyone on the left is calling that the big lie and then they use one of the most dastardly words to attack an opponent which is they call them deniers um but i could tell you agnostically that um, half of the U.S. country does not believe Joe Biden won that election. And half of the country looks at people who believe that and think they're crazy. And as somebody who lives in flyover country but was educated, you know, um, in the cities and worked in the cities for most of my career, I'm just an observer. And I'm observing a situation that seems untenable. Um, it's just untenable. And so something's got to give. Um, let's hope it doesn't fracture the country. Let's hope it doesn't lead to civil war, as you alluded to earlier. But again, the red states own a lot of guns, too. I mean, the Second Amendment needs to be considered here. Um, and they ain't giving up their guns. Not a fucking chance. Not a freaking chance. Yeah. Well, then, listen, um, whether you're a gold bug or a Bitcoin bug, <laughs> You need you need to protect yourself somehow. Yes. <laughs> you better be a bullet bug, as they would say. Yeah. yeah. Well, and here where we can't have guns, it, it, you, this really is our only choice. It, yeah. Maybe yeah. get some get some, and forwards. get some batons. <laughs> Man. Okay. Well, it's always a, a light-hearted conversation. <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least your number is going up, Peter. 
yeah, listen, my numbers are going up. Um, Congratulations, thanks. my friend. I'm genuinely happy for you. Well, look, I'm really pleased for you what's going on in the Substack. Although, when I am interested, when you went for your meeting there, did you go in a green chicken outfit or did you dox yourself to the team? No. Many, many, many people know who we are in real life. Um, we've said on many occasions that this was a brand building exercise. And now we have observed that when people de anonymize, um, it, it destroys the brand intrigue. So we've decided to just keep with it. But hundreds of people know who we are. Stripe knows who we are. Substack knows who we are. Our bankers know who we are. They all know we're doing Doomberg. Many of our friends on Wall Street are cheering us on. Friends in industry I used to work with know we're Doomberg. Um, we have many, many people in the industry cheering us on because that's the niche we've occupied, you know, bringing the industrial voice to the energy debate. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not a big deal to us. And, and we went because we invested in the um, author-led round that Substack did. And then we've always disclosed that to our readers that we're now equity owners in Substack. And we hope the platform succeeds. So far, their views on freedom of speech align very closely to ours. And uh, we'll see if they'll be able to keep those principles uh, intact. Um, but um, we, we made a, a reasonably decent-sized investment in, in Substack, which is consistent with our philosophy around investing privately where we can affect the outcome. Yeah, well, listen, uh, you know I have a preference for in-person interviews. So one day we need to do it, but I think you're going to have to wear a chicken outfit. Yes, certainly. Um, the only way. <laughs> I, I will get one made. Um, but uh, no, it's been great. Always great to chat with you, Peter, and um, always happy when you reach out and have us back on. And uh, even, I wish even the haters in the Bitcoin community well. Well, listen, listen, your shows do well. So even, you know, forget, <laughs> get the few loud. I don't um, mind. Honestly, it, it's, it literally couldn't be less relevant to me. I enjoy it. And, um, and congratulations. Look, I'm happy for them. Genu like, I am genuinely happy for you, Peter. I, it, and my friend, Tony, and all the friends I know that, that are in Bitcoin. I have lots of friends in Bitcoin. I, I hope they do well. Um, well, listen, anyone listening who hasn't checked out, please do go and check out Doombird Substack. We will put it in. Uh, we will put it in the show notes. And as you know, I'm a, I think I'm, I'm a personally paid subscriber. I think you offered it to me. Or maybe I gave you, yours to, that to Danny. But uh, it's one of the few I read. I appreciate uh, it. And I'm subscribed to about eight. I probably should just cancel them. But I do read yours. So yeah. thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure in a few months' time we'll be hooking up again and talking about what crazy shit's going on in the world. Yeah, hopefully there's maybe. some more positive things to talk about. <laughs> yeah, there won't be. There'll be the shit show of an election or World yeah. War Three or yeah, uh, nuclear nuclear bombs going off. But uh, yeah. Yeah, as I long hope, as we can. I hope you have a nice garden, my friend. <sighs> Duberg, thank you so much. Thank you.